Welcome. I'm going to read a book called Progressive Rock by Mr. and Mrs. Wikipedia. And the Prog Dog is here to enjoy it along with you and I. Progressive Rock, shortened as prog, also known as classical rock or symphonic rock, is a broad genre of rock music that developed in the United Kingdom and the United States throughout the mid to late 1960s. Initially termed progressive pop, the style was an outgrowth of psychedelic bands who abandoned standard pop traditions in favor of instrumentation and compositional techniques more frequently associated with jazz, folk, or classical music. Additional elements contributed to its progressive label. Lyrics were more poetic. Technology was harnessed for new sounds. Music approached the condition of art. And the studio, rather than the stage, became the focus of musical activity, which often involved creating music for listening rather than dancing. Prague is based on fusions of styles, approaches, and genres, involving a continuous move between formalism and eclecticism. Due to its historical reception, Prague's scope is sometimes limited to a, a stereotype of long solos, long albums, fantasy lyrics, grandois stage sets and costumes, and an obsessive dedication to technical skill. While the genre is often cited for its merging of high culture and low culture, few artists incorporated literal classical themes in their work to any great degree, and only a handful of groups purposely emulated or referenced classical music. The genre coincided with the mid-1960s economic boom that allowed record labels to allocate more creative control to their artists. Prague saw a high level of popularity in the early to mid-70s, but faded soon after. Conventional wisdom holds that the rise of punk rock caused this, but several more factors contributed to the decline. Music critics, who often labeled the concepts as pretentious, and the sounds as pompous and overblown tended to be hostile toward the genre or to completely ignore it. After the late 1970s, progressive rock fragmented in numerous forms. Some bands achieved commercial success well into the 1980s, albeit with changed lineups and more compact song structures, or crossed into symphonic pop, arena rock, or new wave. Early groups who exhibited progressive features are retroactively described as proto-prog. The Canterbury scene, originating in the late 1960s, denotes a subset of prog bands who emphasized the use of wind instruments, complex chord changes, and long improvisations. Rock in opposition from the late 1970s was more avant-garde, and when combined with the Canterbury style, created avant Prague. In the 1980s, a new subgenre, neo progressive rock, enjoyed some commercial success, although it was also accused of being derivative and lacking in innovation. Post progressive draws upon newer developments in popular music and the avant garde since the mid 1970s. Scope and related terms. The term progressive rock is synonymous with art rock, classical rock, not to be confused with classic rock, and symphonic rock. Historically, art rock has been used to describe at least two related but distinct types of rock music. The first is progressive rock as it is generally understood, while the second usage refers to groups who rejected psychedelia and the hippie counterculture in favor of a modernist avant-garde approach. Similarities between the two terms are that they both describe a mostly British attempt to elevate rock music to a new level of artistic credibility. However, art rock is more likely to have experimental or avant-garde influences. Progressive rock is varied and is based on fusions of styles, approaches, and genres, tapping into broader cultural resonances that connect to avant-garde art, classical music, and folk music, performance, and the moving image. Although a unidirectional English progressive style emerged in the late 1960s, 
By 1967, progressive rock had come to constitute a diversity of loosely associated style codes. When the progressive label arrived, the music was dubbed progressive pop, before it was called progressive rock. With the term progressive referring to the wide range of attempts to break with standard pop music formula. A number of additional factors contributed to the acquired progressive label. Lyrics were more poetic, technology was harnessed for new sounds, music approached the condition of art, some harmonic language was imported from jazz and 19th century classical music. The album format overtook singles. Writer Emily Robinson says that the narrowed definition of progressive rock was a measure against the term's loose application in the late 60s when it was applied to everyone from Bob Dylan to the Rolling Stones. Debate over the genre's criterion continued into the 2010s, particularly on internet forums dedicated to Prague. Relation to Art and Social Theories In early references to the music, progressive was partly related to progressive politics, but those connotations were lost during the 1970s. According to All Music, prog rock began to emerge out of the f- British psychedelic scene in 1967, especially a strain of classical symphonic rock led by the Nice, Procol Harum, and the Moody Blues, Days of Future Past. The availability of newly affordable recording equipment coincided with the rise of a London underground scene in which the psychedelic drug LSD was commonly used. Pink Floyd and Soft Machine functioned as house bands at all-night events at locations such as Middle Earth and the UFO Club, where they experimented with sound textures and long-form songs. Many psychedelic folk rock and early progressive bands were aided by exposure from BBC Radio 1 and DJ John Peel. Jimi Hendrix, who rose to prominence in the London scene and recorded with a band of English musicians, initiated the trend towards guitar virtuosity and eccentricity in rock music. The Scottish band 123, later renamed Clouds, were formed in 1966 and began performing at London clubs a year later. According to Mojo's George Knimer, some claim that they had a vital influence on prog rockers such as Yes, The Nice, and Family. Symphonic rock artists in the late 1960s had some chart success, including the singles Night in White Satin, The Moody Blues in 1967, and A Whiter Shade of Pale, Procol Harum, 1967. The Moody Blues established the popularity of symphonic rock when they recorded Days of Future Past together with the London Festival Orchestra. And Procol Harum, began to use a greater variety of acoustic instruments, particularly in the 1969 album A Salty Dog. Classical influence sometimes took the form of pieces adapted from or inspired by classical works, such as Jeff Beck's Beck's Bolero and parts of the Nice's Ars Longa Vida Brevis. The latter, along with such nice tracks as Rondo and America, reflect a greater interest in music that is entirely instrumental. Sgt. Pepper's and Days both represent a growing tendency toward song cycles and suites made up of multiple movements. Focus, the band Focus, incorporated and articulated jazz-style chords and irregular offbeat drumming into their later rock-based riffs, and several bands that included jazz-style horn sections appeared, including Blood, Sweat, and Tears and Chicago, Of these, Martin highlights Chicago in particular for their experimentation with suites and extended compositions, such as the ballet for a girl in Buchanan and Chicago 2. Jazz influences appeared in the music of British bands such as Traffic, Coliseum, and If, together with the Canterbury scene bands such as Soft Machine and Caravan. Canterbury scene bands emphasize the use of wind instruments, complex chord changes, and long improvisations. Martin writes that in 1968, full-blown progressive rock was not yet in existence, but three bands released albums who would later come to the forefront of the music, Jethro Tull, Caravan, and Soft Machine.
the term progressive rock, which appeared in the liner notes of Caravan's 1968 self-titled debut LP, came to be applied to bands that used classical music techniques to expand the style and concept available to rock music. The Nice, the Moody Blues, Procol Harum, and Pink Floyd all contained elements of what is now called progressive rock, but none represented as complete an example of the genre as several bands that formed soon after. Almost all of the genre's major bands, including Jethro Tull, King Crimson, Yes, Genesis, Van de Graaff, Generator, ELP, Gentle Giant, and Renaissance, released their debut albums during the years 1968 to 1970. Most of these were folk rock albums that gave little indication of what the band's mature sound would come to be. But King Crimson's In the Court of the Crimson King, 1969 was a fully formed example of the genre. Critics assumed the album to be the logical extension and development of late 1960s work exemplified by the Moody Blues, Procol Harum, Pink Floyd, and the Beatles. According to McCann, the album may be the most influential to progressive rock for crystallizing the music of earlier bands into a distinctive, immediately recognizable style. Most of the genre's major bands released their most critical acclaimed albums during the years 1971 to 1976. The genre experienced a high degree of commercial success during the early 1970s. Jethro Tull, ELP, Rush, Yes, and Pink Floyd combined for four albums that reached number one in the U.S. charts, and 16 of their albums reached top ten. Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells in 1973, an excerpt of which was used in the, f- the film at The Exorcist, sold 16 million copies. Progressive rock came to be appreciated overseas, but it mostly remained a European and especially British phenomenon. Few American bands engaged in it, and the purest representatives of the genre, such as Starcastle and Happy the Man, remained limited to their own geographic regions. This is at least in part due to music industry differences between the U.S. and Great Britain. Cultural factors were also involved, as U.S. musicians tend to come from a blues background, while Europeans tended to have a foundation in classical music. North American progressive rock bands and artists often represented hybrid styles, such as the complex arrangements of Rush, the hard rock of Captain Beyond, the southern rock-tinged prog of Kansas, the jazz fusion of Frank Zappa and Return to Forever, and the eclectic fusion of the all-instrumental Dixie Dregs. British progressive rock acts had their greatest U.S. success in the same geographic areas in which British heavy metal bands experienced their greatest popularity. The overlap in audiences led to the success of arena rock bands such as Boston, Kansas, and Styx, who combined elements of the two styles. Progressive rock achieved popularity in continental Europe more quickly than it did in the U.S. Italy remained generally uninterested in rock music until the strong Italian progressive rock scene developed in the early 1970s. Progressive rock emerged in Yugoslavia in the late 1960s, dominating the Yugoslav rock scene until the late 70s. Few of the European groups were successful outside their own countries, with the exceptions of Dutch bands like Focus and Golden Earring, who wrote English-language lyrics, and the Italians Le Orme and PFM, whose English lyrics were written by Peter Hamill and Peter Sinfield, respectively. Some European bands played in a style derivative of English bands, The Cosmic music scene in Germany came to be labeled as Krautwalk internationally and is variously seen as part of a progressive rock genre or an entirely different phenomenon. Krautwalk bands such as Can, which included two members who had studied under Karl Heinz Stockhausen, tended to be more strongly influenced by 20th century classical music than the British prog bands whose musical vocabulary leaned more toward the Romantic era. Many of these groups were very influential, even among bands that had little enthusiasm for the symphonic variety of progressive rock. Concurrently, African-American popular musicians drew from progressive rock's conceptual album-oriented approach 
This led to a progressive soul movement in the 1970s that inspired a newfound sophisticated musicality and ambitious lyricism in black pop. Among these musicians were Sly Stone, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Curtis Mayfield, and George Clinton. In discussing the development, Martin cites 1970s albums by Wonder, Talking Book, Interventions, Songs in the Key of Life, War, All Day Music, The World is a Ghetto, War Alive, and the Isley Brothers, 3 plus 3, while noting that the Who's progressive rock influenced Who Are You, 1978, also drew from the soul variant. Dominic Maxwell of The Times calls Wonder's mid-1970s album Prague Soul of the Highest Order, pushing the form, yet always heartfelt, ambitious, and listenable. Political and social trends in the late 70s shifted away from the early 1970s hippie attitudes that had led to the genre's development and popularity. The rise in punk cynicism made the utopian ideals expressed in progressive rock lyrics unfashionable. Virtuosity was rejected, as the expense of purchasing quality instruments and the time investment of learning to play them were seen as barriers to rock's energy and immediacy. There were also changes in the music industry as record companies disappeared and merged into large media conglomerates. Promoting and developing experimental music was not part of the marketing strategy anymore for these large corporations who focused their attention on identifying and targeting profitable market niches. Four of Progressive Rock's most successful bands, King Crimson, Yes, ELP, and Genesis, went on hiatus or experienced major personnel changes during the mid-1970s. McCann notes in the September 1974 breakup of King Crimson as particularly significant, calling it the point where all English bands in the genre should have ceased to exist. More of the major bands, including Van der Graaff Generator, Gentle Giant, and UK, dissolved between 1978 and 1980. Many bands had, by the mid-70s, reached the limit of how far they could experiment in rock context, and fans had wearied of the extended epic compositions. That's an opinion, I am sorry. The sounds of the Hammond, Minimoog, and Mellotron had been thoroughly explored and their uses became cliched. Those bands who continued to record often simplified their sound, and the genre fragmented from the late 1970s onward. In Robert Fripp's opinion, once progressive rock ceased to cover new ground, becoming a set of conventions to be repeated and imitated, the genre's premise had ceased to be progressive. The era of record labels investing in their artists, giving them freedom to experiment and limited control over their content and marketing, ended with the late 1970s. Corporate artists and repertoire staff exerted an increasing amount of control over the creative process that had previously belonged to the artists, and established acts were pressured to create music with simpler harmony and song structures and fewer changes in meter. A number of symphonic pop bands such as Supertramp, 10CC, The Alan Parsons Project, and ELO brought the orchestral style arrangements into a context that emphasized pop singles while allowing for occasional instances of exploration. Jethro Tull, Gentle Giant, and Pink Floyd opted for a harder sound in the style of arena rock. Few new progressive rock bands formed during this era, and those who did found that record labels were not interested in signing them. The short-lived supergroup UK was a notable exception since its members had established reputations. They produced two albums that were stylistically similar to previous artists and did little to advance the genre. Part of the genre's legacy in this period was its influence on other styles, as several European guitarists brought progressive rock approaches to heavy metal and laid the groundwork for progressive metal. Michael Schenker of UFO and Uli Jean Roth, who replaced Schenker in Scorpions, expanded the modal vocabulary available to guitarists. Roth studied classical music with the intent of using the guitar the way that classical composers used the violin. 
Finally, the Dutch-born and classically trained Alex and Eddie Van Halen formed Van Halen, featuring groundbreaking whammy bar, tapping, and cross-picking guitar performances that influenced shred music in the 1980s. Some established artists moved towards music that was simpler and more commercially viable. Arena rock bands like Journey, Kansas, Styx, GTR, EOLO, and Foreigner either had begun as progressive rock bands or included members with strong ties to the genre. These groups retained some of the song complexity and orchestral style arrangements, but they moved away from lyrical mysticism in favor of more conventional themes such as relationships. Genesis transformed into a successful pop act, and a reformed Yes released the relatively mainstream 90125 in 1983, which yielded their only U.S. number one single, Owner of a Lonely Heart. These radio-friendly groups have been called prog light. One band who remained successful into the 1980s while maintaining a progressive approach was Pink Floyd, who released The Wall late in 1979, the album which brought punk anger into progressive rock. It was a huge success and was later filmed as Pink Floyd The Wall. Punk and prog were not necessarily as opposed as is commonly believed. Both genres reject commercialism, and punk bands did see a need for musical advancement. Author Doyle Green noted that post-punk emerged as a kind of progressive punk. Post-punk artists rejected the high culture references of 1960s rock artists like the Beatles and Bob Dylan, as well as paradigms that defined rock as progressive art or studio perfectionism. In contrast to punk rock, it balances punk's energy and skepticism with art school consciousness, dadaist experimentalism, and atmospheric ambient soundscapes. World music, especially African and Asian traditions, was also a major influence. Progressive Rock's impact was felt in the work of some post-punk artists, although they tended not to emulate classical rock or Canterbury groups, but rather Roxy Music, King Crimson, and Kraut Rock bands, particularly Can. Punishment of Luxuries, music borrowed from both progressive and punk rock. Whilst Alternative TV, who were fronted by the founder of the influential punk fanzine Sniff and Glue, Mark Perry, toured and released a split live album with Gong, offshoot Here and Now. The term post-progressive identifies progressive rock that returns to its original principles while dissociating from the 1970s prog styles, and may be located after 1978. Martin credits Roxy Music's Brian Eno as the subgenre's most important catalyst, explaining that his 1973-77 output merged aspects of progressive rock with a prescient notion of new wave and punk. New wave, which surfaced around 1978-79 with some of the same attitudes and aesthetic as punk, was characterized by Martin as progressive, multiplied by punk. Bands in the genre tended to be less hostile toward progressive rock than the punks, and there were crossovers such as Fripp and Eno's involvement in Talking Heads, and Yes's replacement of Rick Wakeman and John Anderson with the pop duo The Buggles. When King Crimson reformed in 1981, they released an album, Discipline, which McCann says inaugurated the new post-progressive style. The new King Crimson lineup featured guitarist and vocalist Adrian Ballou, who also collaborated with the Talking Heads, playing live with the band and featuring on their new 1980 album, Remain in Light. According to Martin, Talking Heads also created a kind of new wave music that was the perfect synthesis of punk urgency and attitude and progressive rock sophistication and creativity. A good deal of the more interesting rock since that time is clearly post-Talking Heads music, but this means that it is post-progressive rock as well. Neo-progressive rock. A second wave of progressive rock bands appeared in the early 1980s and have since been categorized as a separate neo-progressive rock subgenre. 
these largely keyboard-based bands played extended compositions with complex musical and lyrical structures. Several of these bands were signed by major labels, including Marillion, IQ, Pendragon, and Palace. Most of the genre's major acts released debut albums between 1983 and 85, and shared the same manager, Keith Goodwin, a publicist who had been instrumental in promoting progressive rock during the 1970s. The previous decade's bands had the advantage of appearing during a prominent countercultural movement that provided them with a large potential audience, but the neo-progressive bands were limited to a relatively niche demographic and found it difficult to attract a following. Only Marillion and Saga experienced international success. Neo-progressive bands tended to use Peter Gabriel-era Genesis as their principal model. They were also influenced by punk, hard rock, and punk rock. The genre's most successful band, Marillion, suffered particularly from accusations of similarity to Genesis, although they used a different vocal style, incorporated more hard rock elements, and were very influenced by bands such as Camel and Pink Floyd. Authors Paul Haggerty and Martin Hallowell have pointed out that the neo-progressive bands were not so much plagiarizing progressive rock as they were creating a new style from a progressive rock element, just as the bands of decades before had created new styles from jazz and classical elements. Author Edward McCann counters by pointing out that these bands were at least partially motivated by a nostalgic desire to preserve the past rather than to drive uh, and innovate. 1990s to 2000s. Third wave. A third wave of progressive rock bands who can be also described as a second generation of neo-progressive bands emerged in the 1990s. The use of the term progressive to describe groups that follow in the style of bands from 10 to 20 years earlier is somewhat controversial as it has been seen as a contradiction of the spirit of experimentation and progress. These new bands were aided in part by the availability of personal computer-based recording studios, which reduced album production expenses, and the internet, which made it easier for bands outside the mainstream to reach a widespread audience. Record stores specializing in progressive rock appeared in large cities. The shred music of the 1980s was a major influence on the progressive rock groups of the 1990s. Some of the newer bands, such as the Flower Kings, Spock's Beard and Glass Hammer played a 1970s style symphonic prog, but with an updated sound. A number of them began to explore the limits of the CD in the way that the earlier groups had stretched the limits of a vinyl LP. Progressive Metal Progressive rock and heavy metal have similar timelines. Both emerged from late 1960s psychedelia to achieve a great early 1970s success despite a lack of radio airplay and support from critics, then faded in the mid to late 70s and experienced revivals in the early 80s. Each genre experienced a fragmentation of styles at this time, and many metal bands from the new wave of British heavy metal, most notably Iron Maiden, onwards displayed progressive rock influences. Progressive Metal reached a point of maturity with Queensryche 1988 concept album Operation Mind Crime and Voivod's 1989 Nothing Face, which featured abstract lyrics and a King Crimson-like texture, and Dream Theater's 1992 Images and Words. Progressive rock elements appeared in other metal subgenres. Black metal is conceptual by definition due to its prominent theme of questioning the values of Christianity. Its guttural voices are sometimes used by bands who can be classified as progressive, such as Mastodon, Mudvayne, and Opeth. The symphonic metal is an extension of the tendency toward orchestral passages in early progressive rock. Progressive rock has also served as a key inspiration for such post-rock, post-metal, and avant-garde metal, math rock, power metal, and neoclassical metal groups. New Prague, not to be confused with Neo Prague, New Prague describes the wave of progressive rock bands in the 2000s who revived the genre. According to Entertainment Weekly's Evan Serpik, 
Along with recent success stories like System of Down and up-and-comers like Dillinger Escape Plan, Lightning Bolt, Coheed and Cambria, and the Mars Volta, create incredibly complex and inventive music that sounds like a, a heavier, more aggressive version of the 70s behemoths such as Led Zeppelin and King Crimson. 2010s. The Progressive Music Awards were launched in 2012 by British magazine Prague to honor the genre's established acts and to promote its newer bands. Honorees, however, are not invited to the perform at the awards ceremonies as the promoters want an event that doesn't last three weeks. Festivals. Many prominent progressive rock bands got their initial exposure at large rock festivals that were held in Britain during the late 1960s and early 1970s. King Crimson made their first major appearance at the 1969 Hyde Park Free Concert before a crowd estimated to be as large as 650,000 people in support of the Rolling Stones. Emerson, Lake and Palmer debuted in the 1970 Isle of Wight Festival at which Supertramp, Family, and Jethro Tull also appeared. Jethro Tull were also present at the 1969 Newport Jazz Festival, the first year in which that festival invited rock bands to perform. Hawkwind appeared at many British festivals throughout the 1970s, although they sometimes showed up uninvited, set up a stage at the periphery of the event, and played for free. Renewed interest in the genres in the 1990s led to the, led to the development of progressive rock festivals. Prague Fest, organized by Greg Walker and David Overstreet in 1993, was first held in UCLA's Royce Hall and featured Sweden's Anglegard, the UK's IQ, Quill and Citadel. Calprog was held annually in Whittier, California during the 2000s. The Northeast Art Rock Festival, or Nearfest, held its first event in 1999 in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and held annual sold out concerts until 2012's Nearfest Apocalypse, which featured headliners UK and Renaissance. Other festivals included the annual Prague Day, the longest running and only outdoor Prague festival in Chapel Hill in North Carolina, the annual Rites of Spring Festival, Rose Fest, in Sarasota, Florida, the Rogue Independent Music Festival in Atlanta, Georgia, Baja Prague in Mexicali, Mexico, Prague Power USA in Atlanta, Georgia, Prague Power Europe in Bearlo, Netherlands, and Prague Stock in Rathway, New Jersey, which held its first event in 2017. Progressive Nations Tour was held in 2008 and 2009 with Dream Theater as the headline act. Night of the Prague in St. Gorshausen, Germany is an established European progressive rock festival held every July during two to three days for over 12 years. Reception The genre has received both critical acclaim and criticism throughout the years. Progressive rock has been described as parallel to the classical mode of Igor Stravinsky or Bella Partok. This desire to expand the boundaries of rock, combined with musicians' dismissiveness toward mainstream rock and pop, dismayed critics and led to accusations of elitism. Its intellectual, fantastic, and apolitical lyrics, the shunning of rock's blues roots, were abandonments of the very things that many critics valued in rock music. Progressive rock also represented the maturation of rock as a genre, but there was an opinion among critics that rock was and should remain fundamentally tied to the adolescence. So, so rock and maturity were mutually exclusive. Criticism over the complexity of their music provoked some bands to create music that was even more complex. Most of the musicians involved were male, as was the case for most rock of the time. Female singers were better represented in progressive folk bands, who displayed broader range of vocal styles than the progressive rock bands, with whom they frequently toured and shared band members. British and European audiences typically followed concert hall behavior protocols associated with the classical music performance and were more reserved in their behavior than audience for other forms of rock. This confused musicians during U.S. tours, as they found American audiences less attentive and more prone to outbursts during quiet passages. These aspirations toward high culture reflect progressive rock's origin as a music created largely by upper- and middle-class, white-collar, college-educated males from southern England. 
The music never reflected the concerns of or was embraced by the working class listeners, except in the U.S., where listeners appreciated the music's virtuosity. Progressive rock's exotic literary topics were considered particularly irrelevant to British youth during the late 70s, when the nation suffered from a poor economy and frequent strikes and shortages. Even King Crimson leader Robert Fripp dismissed progressive rock lyrics as the philosophical meanderings of some English halfwit who is circumnavigating some inessential point of experience in his life. Bands whose darker lyrics avoided utopianism, such as King Crimson, Pink Floyd, and Van de Graaff Generator, experienced less critical disfavor. I wasn't a big fan of most of what you'd call progressive rock, remarked Floyd guitarist David Gilmore. I'm like Groucho Marx. I don't want to belong to any club that would have me for its member. I still like the original term that comes from 1969, progressive rock, but that was with a small p and a small r. Prog rock, on the other hand, has different connotations of grandeur and pomposity. Commented Jethro Tull frontman Ian Anderson on the nuance of the genre. Back then, when we were doing Thick as a Brick bands like Yes and Emerson, Lake and Palmer were already gaining a reputation for being a little pompous and showing off with their music. I think that was okay. The reality is that certain members of Yes were quite humorous about it. They could laugh at themselves, as indeed ELP privately laughed amongst themselves about themselves, he added. But that's part of what was going on back then, and I think looking back on it, that most of it was pretty good experience for musicians and listeners alike. Some of it was a little overblown, but in the case of much of the music, it was absolutely spot on. And so closes our little story time here. Thanks for watching. Looks like Prog Dog fell asleep. Good night, Prog Dog, and good night to you.